Excellence, Mesdames et Messieurs, si vous me permettez, au nom de la diversité, de dire quelques mots en français avant que le reste de cette manifestation se poursuive en français, j'aimerais vous adresser la plus cordiale bienvenue à cette manifestation organisée avec le Geneva Gender Champions et notre programme devenu centre. J'y reviendrai euh, sur le genre et le changement global. C'est un grand plaisir que de vous accueillir tous euh, pour cette manifestation le 8 mars, journée internationale euh, des femmes, dont vous savez tous euh, qu'elle date d'un peu plus d'un siècle et qu'elle a été l'aboutissement d'une longue période de mobilisation des mouvements féministes euh, en Europe et aux États-Unis et que cette mobilisation a porté des fruits certains dans toute une série de pays, de part et d'autre de l'Atlantique. On a vu dans les années 1970 un pays qui pense être la plus vieille démocratie du monde, qui est en fait la plus jeune démocratie d'Europe, la Suisse, donner le droit de vote aux femmes, on a vu quelques années plus tard les Nations Unies proclamer le 8 mars Journée internationale des femmes, probablement en se disant que si les Suisses avaient fait le pas, il était sage pour l'ONU de faire de même. Et aujourd'hui, la mobilisation reste extrêmement importante pour l'avenir non seulement des femmes, mais de l'humanité, pour que nous puissions tous travailler ensemble dans le sens de la promotion des femmes et de, la, de leur parité, euh, qui est la seule manière euh, de faire se développer des sociétés démocratiques euh, et pacifiques. Et je suis particulièrement content de prononcer ces quelques mots dans une institution qui a placé l'étude, l'enseignement et la recherche sur les questions de genre euh, dans une position tout à fait euh, forte et qui a soutenu la création d'un programme qui est devenu euh, ces jours-ci un centre euh, sur l'étude du genre et du changement global qui a engagé toute une série de professeurs, femmes, dans les dernières années à, au terme d'une politique volontariste ce qui, ce qui nous vaut aujourd'hui un équilibre des genres au niveau professoral, qui est probablement l'un des plus élevés d'Europe occidentale, mais qui reste très en dessous de ce qu'il devrait être, puisque avec 60, un peu plus de 60% de jeunes filles qui étudient au niveau du master et du doctorat chez nous, il est parfaitement anormal que nous n'ayons que 30 ou 35% de femmes parmi les professeurs. Et donc, ce jour est une excellente occasion pour euh, ranimer le courant de mobilisation, euh, non seulement à travers euh, le monde, euh, mais aussi dans des institutions académiques comme la nôtre, pour que nous fassions quelques pas supplémentaires en direction euh, de euh, la place que les femmes doivent euh, avoir euh, aux côtés des hommes et qui, est, qui doit être à l'égal de celle euh, des hommes, puisque comme le disait un chanteur aujourd'hui disparu, la femme est l'avenir de l'homme. Je vous remercie et je passe la parole à M Michael Muller, directeur général de l'ONU. Merci, professeur Burin. Happy International Women's Day, everybody. And um, first of all, as I said, let me wish you a happy International Women's Day. It's an important day, and it's an increasingly important day as a catalyst for action. Because today is not just a day to highlight the uh, crucial contributions by women to society. It is also a day for all of us to celebrate the achievements of grassroots movements and leaders who drive progress by demanding equality globally and locally. So let us use this day and this important debate here at the Graduate Institute to renew our shared commitment to, for true gender equality across the international community. And we can start here, right in Geneva. Here, 
We work for peace, rights, and well-being every day. And these noble goals will remain elusive without the full participation of women and girls at all levels of society, which is why Ambassador Hamamoto and I launched the Geneva Gender Champions Initiative last year with the support of women at the table. With now close to 100 gender champions, including international organizations, member states, non-state actors, we are changing the way we do business. At the heart of this initiative is the panel Parity Pledge. It implies that at least one participant from each gender needs to be represented in panel discussions. And in addition to this, each gender champion chooses two more concrete, measurable commitments for gender equality in their organization. The network is about practical steps that fit the context, and we're working with UN Women now to hopefully see this being launched in other UN duty stations across the world. Through this flexibility, we acknowledge that uh, to achieve gender equality, we must look beyond parity and numbers. But what the incredible growth of the network has shown is that simple, concrete commitments can trigger collective action. The announcements by the director, Mr. Burin, our host, of the important commitments by the Graduate Institute are excellent examples. <laughs> they will further strengthen Geneva's place as a facilitator of dialogue and critical thinking for progress. This kind of action and more efforts to achieve gender equality are urgently needed. By some estimates, gender equality in the workplace won't be achieved until 2095 if we continue business as we do now. That is completely ridiculous and way too late. So we need a game changer. And looking at just how many different organizations came together in the preparation of today's discussion alone, I hope and I'm confident that Geneva Gender Champions Initiative will help bring about the transformation needed, not least by sparking discussions and hopefully action uh, like today's event. So I thank everyone involved in organizing this debate and look forward to a thought-provoking exchange. And before stepping down, I just noticed that sentence here, and I thought I'd answer it, if you, I may. I know it's probably outside the, uh, <laughs> the program or the way. Sorry to shoot it down. But honestly, um, you know, unless we do get gender parity, that's what is going to be a risky gamble for all of us. Um, we are not going to achieve uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, we are not going to achieve the goals set out in COP21, we are not going to achieve any of the other goals we have worked on this year unless we bring in the other half of humanity, and it's urgent. So let's get to it. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Scott Weber, and I'm the Director General of Interpeace. I've been offered the opportunity to moderate this uh, day's debate, and I'd like to thank the organizers, the Geneva Gender Champions, um, headed and spearheaded by Ambassador Hamamoto and Director General Muller here in Geneva, and the Graduate Institute's uh, program on gender and global change. This is part, if not the launch, of events on International Women's Day. The topic of today's debate, the gender parity game changer or gamble, I wanted to clarify one thing, which is that I don't think any of the speakers today believe that gender equality isn't important. The question is the path to gender equality. Is it best served by gender parity policies, or do they in fact sometimes undermine or distract from the goal? That's the debate that we're having today. And the motion, which was deliberately a bit controversial, is to say that gender parity is a risky gamble. Now, I'd like to explain the rules of the game for how this works. You were polled when you came into the room on what you felt about the motion. Are you for the motion or are you against the motion? We're going to have two speakers arguing for and two speakers arguing against. The winning team is not the team that gets more votes. The winning team is the team that persuades more people to change their mind, okay? That's the game, that's what we're after, is persuasion. So we have some initial results from the, uh, the polling, which I will announce in a second, but what we're really looking for is the swing vote. 
And there are a number of people who said, I don't know. And I'll tell you how many. And that's part of the, part of the group that we have to win over, speakers. Um, so the speakers are going to have four minutes each. At the three minute mark, I'm going to clink my glass, which means they have one minute left. And I'll clink it again when their time is up and they need to be disciplined, they've promised to be disciplined. We're then going to have 45 minutes of exchange with all of you. We want to make this an interactive discussion. Uh, and then our speakers are going to have two minutes each to sum up. During the summing up process, you will be asked to vote again. And you've received in your little pamphlets there these uh, voting papers. If you want to vote uh, for the motion that, that gender parity policies are a gamble, put the green uh, piece of paper in the box that it will come around. If you believe that it is a game changer, you're voting against the motion, put the blue one in the box. And if you still don't know, which I hope is not the case, we hope not to see many white, white papers in the box, vote the white paper, okay? They're in your little pamphlets. Um, if I can invite the speakers up to the stage to join me. Um, I, uh, at the end of the debate, we're also going to have a closing word by uh, Ambassador Hamamoto, and then I will announce the final results. Now, in terms of the initial results, just so you know, we had a 13% vote that it is a gamble, gender parity policies are a gamble, 62% voted that they are a game changer, and 25% voted, I don't know. Okay, 25% of the room is to be won over. Now, last two words, and this is on, uh, on uh, uh, kind of logistics. If you're expecting a phone call from Ban Ki-moon on the Syria talks during this debate, please leave your phone on. Okay? If you're not expecting a phone call, please turn your phone on silent. Please. And the other thing is to notice the hashtag, gender parity. Uh, we expect you to be tweeting vigorously in order to make as much noise about this debate as you can. Okay? Good. So, we have four very distinguished speakers. We're very lucky to have this group together. Um, and our first speaker is Stuart Halford, who has an extensive background in advancing sexual and reproductive rights throughout the UN system, in particular the treaty monitoring bodies and the universal periodic reviews of the Human Rights Council. He is currently the representative to the UN for the Sexual Rights Initiative a coalition of organizations advocating on human rights in relation to gender and sexuality. Stuart, you're arguing for the motion, and the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, and thank you for the invite. Um, okay, gender parity is not a game changer. It's just one piece of a very large and complex puzzle and is a long way from being an effective response to gender inequality. Gender parity enforces the representation of women in decision-making roles, and while this can be effective in beginning to shift perceptions about the roles of, and perspectives of, of some women, it doesn't address the need to proactively eliminate gender discrimination and the barriers that many women face, including social, legal, and cultural barriers that prevent women's involvement in key roles. And these barriers, of course, include limited educational and employment opportunities, limited access to health services, especially in relation to sexual and reproductive health, limited childcare options, spousal consent laws, stereotyping, and so on. Parity is not equality, and there's no single course of action that can be taken on its own that can address gender inequality. And if we are to tackle gender inequality, then we need to recognize that it's the responsibility of everyone at every level to ask the important questions. Who is missing from the table and why? How can women be empowered to access the tools they need to succeed? What are the structural barriers in place preventing gender parity as a matter of course? We must then work to integrate these answers to these questions into the programs, policies, laws, and general discourse that have the potential to facilitate or prevent women's participation in public life. Parity as a goal instead of as an outcome of sustained efforts, to address inequality suggests that the objective is for women to achieve symbolic equality with men, rather than true equality. True equality means freedom from the constraints of patriarchy and recognizing how factors like gender, age, and sexuality intersect. 
Patriarchy therefore means that marginalized groups of women, men, and trans folk experience disempowerment and marginalization more frequently, more harshly, more violently, and with worse results. So when we look at participation, it, mu it must be about not just blindly ensuring parity, it must seek to enfranchise in all spaces the most marginalized and excluded. Otherwise, that those brought in by parity efforts will all be pri privileged and conform to prevailing social norms. And why are we just talking about gender parity? Does gender parity really reflect the diversity of society? If we are to get true representation of society in key positions, then should we not be addressing gender from an intersectional perspective so as to include parity of race, parity of disability, parity of sex, parity of age? And let's not forget the need for parity of opportunity. So gender parity on its own does nothing to ensure true representation of our, diverse, of our diverse societies. And when we think of gender parity, why are we only thinking of gender as a binary concept? Clearly gender parity ignores gender fluidity and in doing so reinforces binary politics at the expense of those who transgress um, gender norms. Gender is not binary and nor is society. As such, gender parity can be said to actually discriminate against those whose gender does not conform to societal norms. And using discrimination as a tool by which to enforce quotas and enforce representation will not get us very far. So if gender parity is the answer, as my colleagues will argue, um, what happens to those who do not conform to the gender norms that patriarchy dictates that they must? Clearly, they're excluded, and this exclusion leads to discrimination, which, of course, helps to perpetuate patriarchy in the first place, which reinforces the norms and stereotypes that lead to gender inequality. So in reality, parity does not imply quality, and nor does it imply quality. So while gender parity is a small step in the right direction, it is certainly not the game changer. It's a long way from the game changer, and I ask you to vote for the motion. Thank you. Very, very nicely. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you. Our next speaker, uh, arguing against the motion, is Elizabeth Prugel, who's a leading scholar on gender politics and international governance and the neoliberalization of feminism, and has published extensively in this field. Lisa is professor of international relations and political science here at the Graduate Institute, and she directs the Institute's newly upgraded Center on Gender and Global Change. Elizabeth, the floor is yours. Thank you. Gender parity is not a risky gamble. It's a brilliant strategy to advance gender equality. And this is the key. Don't be misled. Gender parity is a strategy. It is not the goal. Behind the idea of gender parity as a strategy, there's a theory of change. There's a powerful theory of change. And that theory of change says that if we bet on democracy, then we will actually achieve better outcomes. One of the basic ingredients of democracy is equality. You cannot have democracy without equality, without equal participation without having people in institutions of power that actually look like the populations that they are pretending to represent. This is true not only for women. It is true for all kinds of categories of people who are now subordinated and excluded from power. So I think of parity as a fundamental tool for the representation of difference. We know that such a representation matters. And let me just give you some examples. My first example comes from parliamentary quotas. A lot of countries have those quotas in place today. We know that women uh, have often different interests and different preferences. Just think about the US primaries. <laughs> Women, for the most part, tend to vote much less Republican. This is consistent over many decades now. And they are certainly not voting for Trump. 
Another example is the much studied example of Indian village councils, the panchayats, where we've had now many years of uh, experience with quotas and uh, something that, that economists love, nam namely that this is kind of a quasi-natural experience uh, experiment because some uh, councils have quotas and others don't. And so what you see when you look at those panchayats is that those panchayats that have women, that have 30% women and more uh, in, in, in them, actually tend to do different things. They tend to focus, for example, on water and on making sure that there's water in the village and that you don't have to walk, not you, right? It's the women that have to walk uh, many, many miles in order to get the water. Uh, in other words, when women are represented, then their interests get also reflected in the policies that come out of those various institutions. Now, there's all kinds of institutions that are important in this. It is not just parliaments, but there's also power in other institutions. There's power in academia. There is power in the media in terms of sh shaping uh, discourses. There is power in the courts. And there's power on company boards. All of these institutions matter. We can even talk about whether there is power in the family, and therefore we should have parity in parenting, for example. There's plenty of good arguments for that. Uh, and obviously, there we need different po po policies. Thus, there's no doubt in my mind that bringing gender parity and diverse voices into institutions of influence is a game changer. It will change the issues that will be talked about, the policies that will emerge, and the solutions that will be implemented. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before our next speaker goes up, I would just like to ask you to prepare your questions. Uh, we're going to go into questions in rounds. I'll ask, three, I'll ask the audience three or four questions. The panel will then try to answer them and then we'll go back for more. But start preparing your questions already. Our next speaker is Kate Gilmore. She's globally known for her work on the prevention of violence against women and has worked in a wide range of high profile public sector and NGO positions. Previously, as Deputy Secretary General of Amnesty International, she was appointed to the United Nations Deputy High Commissioner for Human Rights on the 1st of December, 2015. Kate, Thank the floor you. is yours. Uh, look, if, if I may, good day. I come from a gambling country. <laughs> I know what makes for a good bet and what doesn't. A bet on gender parity is a game changer. Look, the stakes are too high and the odds are loaded against us. Gender-based discrimination, it's a reckless, unfounded, unjust system of imputation of characteristics and attributions to groups of people who may have nothing more in common than their genitalia. It narrows, it distorts, it hinders, it stifles talent, diversity and potential. It seeks to justify a gendered basis for the distribution of power, opportunity and influence. It paves the way for gender-based violence and other human rights abuses. It's intricate Byzantium confinement of human ability. That's a complex problem. And as has been said, for every complex problem, there's an answer that's clear and simple and wrong. Gender discrimination, that's not just about changing numbers. What is so disarmingly alarming about gender-based discrimination is its intractability and its capability of shape-shifting. Despite the numbers, yes, in Rwanda, 60% of lower house parliamentarians are women, but still, gender-based violence afflicts 40% of all women. In Bolivia, 50% of parliamentarians are women, there's still a severe gender gap in employment. Iceland tops the World Economic Forum's ranking of all countries by their respect for gender equality, yet even with a respectable 41% of all parliamentarians women, it still does not have equal pay for equal work. Are we to believe somehow, mysteriously, that a 9% increase in the number of women on the floor of Iceland's parliament will be a game changer? <laughs> Seriously? Oh, come on. It's never about the numbers. For the woman raped by her husband 
and then denied recourse. For the girl whose childhood is snatched away from her by marriage. For the adolescent whose unplanned pregnancy tears apart her ill-prepared body and derails her future for the mother denied access to contraceptives, for the woman attacked on a bus, exactly what is the 50-50 equation? More boys married as children? More men with unwanted pregnancies? More women more violent to their intimate partners? Come on. This is not about numbers. These toxic stratifications of the human condition, they're never unilinear. Gender-based discrimination, as my very esteemed colleague <laughs> said, intersects deeply with other bigotries, bigotries of race and disability, sexual orientation, age, ethnicity, caste, religion. The gender parity numbers games will never reveal the full story of those intersectionalities, nor monitor our adherence to that essential truth that we're all born equal in dignity and in rights. This is not about numbers, a false seduction of the hackneyed assurance that somehow because we measure something, it matters to us more. That's just yet more evidence that we're caught up in a metricocracy, not a meritocracy. The formula for justice for women and girls is not gender parities, arithmetic, but something qualitatively quite different. It needs a deeper subversion of those internal maps of patriarchy and other such bigotries that we all, women and men, carry in our heads. It needs deeply qualitative change. And that's why, dear friends, it's called equality, not equantity. <laughs> We cannot be, afford to be distracted in our struggle for gender equality by the inadequate promise of gender parity. The proposition must stand. Well All right. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Arancha Gonzalez. She's been a leading actor in promoting opportunities for women's economic empowerment, particularly women entrepreneurs. She served as Chief of Staff to the WTO under Director General Pascal Lamy and is currently Executive Director of the International Trade Center. Arancha, the floor is yours. Raise your hands if you think that betting is something good, other than Kate, of course. <laughs> Raise your hands if you think that gambling is an admirable habit. Risk is the possibility that something bad or unpleasant will happen. So raise your hands if you understood the negative connotations associated with gender parity embodied in the language of this motion before you walked into this room. I put it to you that voting in favor of this motion is the risky gamble, which is why I vote no, I vote no to this motion, and I hope you also will vote no to this motion. Losing as much as $28 trillion of global GDP by 2025 as a result of gender inequality, that is a risky gamble. Keeping the equivalent of the population of China or India out of a full economic activity, that is a bet, a risk, and a gamble. Despite progress on multiple fronts, gender parity is still a long way away, and frankly, gender equality even further. Let's be clear. Equality is the goal. Parity is an end to this goal. Fact one, there are more CEOs in Fortune 500 companies called John than there are women. <laughs> companies with diverse leadership, with diverse boards, are more successful because diversity matters. We know it intuitively, but it also makes business sense. Fact two. In over 90% of our countries in this world, gender-related discrimination is written into the law. In 32 countries, women need permission to apply for a passport. In 18 countries, women are not allowed to get a job without permission from a male family member. In four countries, women are not allowed to register a business. In 38 countries, female surviving spouses do not have the same inheritance rights as their male counterparts. Many men cannot possess land or property. And you know what? No collateral, no credit. Fact three, SMEs that export are more competitive 
They are more productive, they pay better wages. Guess what? Only one in five exporting SMEs are women-owned companies. Is this a sensible bet when we know that countries that provide more economic opportunities for women are more competitive in the global economy? Equality is a prerequisite for achieving well-functioning economies and the type of societies that you and I want to live in. This, of course, is not an easy matter. If it was an easy matter, we would have solved it. Yes, gender inequalities are multifaceted. Yes, they are complex and often deeply entrenched in social norms and traditions. But gender is not about genitalia. Gender is social. You may say that gender parity is too simplistic to be a game changer. You may say that it's a numbers game. You may say that it distracts. I tell you, you cannot build a house without a very solid foundation. And I argue to you today that gender parity is a solid foundation on which to build gender equality. Gender parity is not about gender as a binary construct. It's about diversity and inclusion. It's a necessary step to creating an environment that yields ideas and solutions. A first step to break down stereotypes of what people can and cannot do. Supporting the motion that betting on gender parity as the game changer is a risky gamble is like denying refugees emergency assistance because it's not enough to stop wars, to stop conflict, and to stop poverty, which are the root causes of refugees. <laughs> Finally, gender parity is not just a numbers game. We all know that. What gets measured counts. Gender parity gives us a, usual me a useful measure to change mindsets. I'm willing to bet that my colleagues across the bench would not disagree with my arguments because they are drawn from facts. If you can give me a single principle that has more chances of being a game changer for gender equality than gender parity, I buy it. In the meantime, please defeat this vote motion. Vote against. No, no, no. <laughs> this is a predictably spicy topic. You should have seen the speakers before the event. They were all trying to get the other one to change sides. <laughs> Goodness. All right, let's open the floor. Uh, and please keep your comments to, no, actually, to questions, not comments. And very brief, please. We want to get as many as possible in uh, before the end of this, uh, this event. So. Put your hands up if you have questions. Madam there. Uh, thank you for the very, very entertaining and Sorry, and, and say who oh, you yes, are yes, and who I'm, you're asking the question to. Um, my name is Rebecca Epen. I'm the Senior Gender Advisor with UNHCR. Uh, this is a question that is not, I mean, I suppose it will be to um, Lisa and, and Arancha. Um, there are many efforts on, on ensuring gender parity today. Even at UNHCR, we struggle with it, but we are trying to do it. Um, the, the, the struggle really is about moving from formal equality to substantive equality. And my question is around accountability, really. You know, where, where does the accountability lie in terms of creating accountability standards to ensuring their substantive equality, as uh, the other panel has uh, spoken about? And, and how do we make sure that institutions can ensure this, or even initiatives such as the Gender Geneva Champions can ensure the, these standards are met? Thank you very much. Uh, we have a lady way at the back. Can I just say we have a great turnout today for an event at 3 p.m. <laughs> on a Tuesday. This is fantastic. Shows how much interest there is in the topic. Um, hi, uh, my name is Safaya. I'm a first year master's student here at the Institute in Economics. And my question is uh, to the speakers who are um, for the motion. Um, while I understand that gender is a very intersectional issue and your arguments were very persuasive, my question is what is the alternative? If you are proposing that gender parity is not the policy that we should be adopting, that what kind of policies are there that will address this intersectionality? Thank you. Great. I think we had a question from Ambassador McCartney up front. Thank you. I'm Rosemary McCartney. I'm the Canadian ambassador here in Geneva. Um, so uh, taking this down to a very practical level, 
Um, a question I'd like to ask is that one of the particular gender biases that working women experience is when they become mothers. And that often perpetuates, perpetuates gender equality, not just in the workplace then, but also at the household level in the home. In Canada, all parents can access a shared parental leave. It sounds good. It's flexible between parents 50-50, but only one in five fathers take advantage of this parental leave. In the province of Quebec, the provincial government has introduced this new leave designated only for fathers, with the aim of boosting male participation in the household level. So it's a new experiment. So we know parental leave law ensures job protection and financial security, but what does it do for gender bias? So my question to the panel is, and, and you can decide on both sides which of you speaks, would gender parity in parental leave be a game changer or a gamble for gender bias in the workplace and also at home? Thank you very much. One more question. Madam? Thank you. My name is Nina Joyce. I'm a UN representative with Graduate Women International. We've heard four fantastic, riveting arguments. Unfortunately, there isn't time to address the subtleties of these arguments. So in, in uh, instituting gender parity policies, do we not create other problems, such as inefficient markets? Um, do we reduce meritocracy? Thank you. All right, good. So perhaps the first question was to you on accountability standards and how to ensure compliance. Wouldn't you like to take that? So let's say that uh, accountability has to be beyond counting numbers, beyond, beyond counting your chicken. Uh, it's not just about one, two, three, four, five. It's what this one contains, the two contains, the three contains. So you have to unpack. This is why measures of progress and measures, the, the indicators we will use to measure progress are so important. And this is where the discussion has to get a bit more sophisticated. And this is where very often we are not doing a good enough job. We just count the numbers without looking at the realities behind the numbers. So we have to go beyond, look beyond. So make sure that we go into a qualitative analysis as opposed to just simply looking and counting the numbers. Do you want to add to that? Uh, yeah, just, just uh, one idea on this. So there is this idea, okay, that we have women maybe on important institutions, but somehow nothing really actually happens for various reasons that has to do with various barriers and so on. So how do you get beyond that? Uh, one thing I think we really need to get away from is to have the idea that there is such a thing as a women's interest that pre-exists the discussions that are actually happening in these contexts. And so I think what needs to happen is actually empowering women so that they can uh, participate in the formulation of what these interests are in powerful institutions. Um, how do you get there? Obviously, you probably have answers to this uh, much better than I would have. It goes in the direction of empowerment, empowering women and reducing uh, uh, barriers. It also goes in the direction of thinking of other ways of communication, right? Because there's a certain form of communication that dominates uh, uh, bodies like that. So to me, parity is a, is a first step to that, uh, but there's a lot more that has to happen, clearly. Thank you. So the team for the motion, would you like to take uh, the question about what are the alternatives? And then the on the parental leave question as well. Sure. Okay. Um, in respect to the, the alternative, okay, gender parity. So we have equal men and equal women presiding in a cabinet or whatever. And of these men and women, are we going to say there needs to be a quota that's gay, that's black, that's disabled? What? How do we how do we break down this? So, f so for me, I mean, it, parity is quite simply, it's just one very small step on a very very complicated road. In regards to the question from Canada, um, and I think that's a great question around the the parental leave. But I think instead of focusing on parity. We should, we should focus on addressing the stereotypes in public and private life 
that circumscribes women as the primary caregiver for children while men are the primary breadwinners, which is obviously harmful for men, women, and children. We also need to look at the gender wage gap, which influences parents' decisions when deciding who will take parental leave. Then, obviously, we need to transform the prevailing ideology of work and society that does not recognize the need for family-friendly policies, including flexi time, family leave, etc., for women and men. And of course, we have to recognize that such policies will help retain skilled, experienced, and dedicated employees. So, so when we get to the stage where men are not penalized and are actually encouraged to take parental leave in larger numbers, we'll see a shift in the culture around this towards more equitable caregiving and, and work responsibilities. And that's something that we need to, to push for, so that's great. But again, parity is the outcome, it's not the goal. Still, everyone vote for the motion. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kate. And, and very briefly, you know, I, I think the, uh, the point that the underlying premise needs to be challenged is important. And uh, to speak to that uh, great question about what's the alternative, in a way, we're talking about how many apples are in a rotten barrel. I mean, the issue is not the number of apples in the barrel. The issue is that the barrel itself is rotten. And, in fact, when we talk of parity, have you noticed how we talk about elites? And that our image of parity is an elite project. We're not talking about equalising men in poverty. We're not talking about equalising vulnerability to sexual violence. We're talking about a privileged project that privileges and sustains elites and will benefit elites. The true price and cost of gender-based discrimination, discrimination is paid by those who will never make the grade because it's never just about gender. Of course it's about gender, but it's never just about gender, and that's why the number counting is wrong. It's the barrel that's the problem, not the number of apples. And in that regard, of course, numbers, I mean, it's interesting, and you know, we've just spent a lot of time arguing about percentages and targets and indicators and goals in the sustainable development agenda. But at the heart of it, there is something fundamentally wrong with a world that is deepening inequality and still considering the underlying economic model acceptable. The problem is the barrel. And we have to break down that barrel and recreate it if apples are to be treated differently. And that means getting to the core. I hope that's appealing. <laughs> I'm going back. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, the right of response, yes, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Then we, we, please prepare your questions. I want to see some hands up of who has questions. Okay, good. So prepare your questions. Yes. I have a big problem with the fact that parity is about elites. It's equal pay for equal job about elites? Just asking. So do we wait until we change our economic model to pay women the same amount of money we would pay men for the same job? So it's all fine to talk about barrels, it is all fine to talk about economic constructs, but please, in the meantime, equal pay for equal job. <laughs> Very good. All right, questions. Uh, lady up front. We have uh, Ambassador Quinn. Please. Hello, uh, my name is Danielle. I'm currently with UNFPA. Um, my question is, how do you ensure gender parity as a strategy in a context where women cannot access the positions in governments and companies because of a lack of access to comprehensive reproductive health and family planning, education, and other restrictions on women's freedom of movement, just as examples? Very good. Thank you. Ambassador Quinn. Thank you very much, and let me add my congratulations to what really is an interactive dialogue. I hope this particular model can go to the Human Rights Council, but... Um, <laughs> Um, my name's John Quinn, and I'm not a CEO. Um, Submit but, a motion, uh, would you? <laughs> but I'm the Australian ambassador here, and let me say what a thought-provoking discussion we've just had. The, the formulation's quite interesting, you know, risk, uh, gambling, probability, and I come back to the, the issues of the cost of not taking action, and it seems to me that the, uh, the case to my right has made a very powerful argument that basically that the costs and risks of not 
moving on on a parity are, are critical. And I just would be interested in the comments of the other side on on what are the risks really. I guess there are risks in terms of attitudes. I, I get the arguments about that, but I think the you know the business case to use the terribly brutal metric um, for action is is so persuasive. And I'm just I remember we had our discrimination commission on gender here through through here last year, and she was talking about her experience with the Australian Defence Force working with defence. And her argument to them was, you're crazy not to engage women in your workforce because your, your capability is impaired. And I think we need to focus on the argument of capability as much as equity and, and human rights because you know we're losing out. We're losing this colossal capability, uh, all our societies, whether it's peacemaking, whether it's economic. So I'd be interested in the comments of the, the team to the left on, on that particular issue because it does seem to me that looking at risk, and we believe in risk-based public policy, the risk of not taking action is substantial. And I guess I'm with the team on the right that this is really a strategy and part of it is to shift uh, attitudes. And again, I come back to the Gender Champions Initiative that Michael Muller and uh, Pamela have led on, uh, which really has shifted attitudes in Geneva. And, and words can, can shift attitudes. And I just make the point, I think parity is quite a powerful word. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have a lady at the back in the blue. Thank you, Liliane Landonova, Professor at the Graduate Institute. I have two questions to each camp. Uh, the first goes to Lisa and Tarancha. Um, how would you respond to concerns that by focusing too much on gender parity, you actually may be deflecting attention from the more fundamental power inequalities that we need to be tackling? And one good example is the current obsession that the UN Secretary General has to be a woman in the next election, but yet we know that even the national nominations are very much a product of the very old paternalistic political networks that are absolutely dominated by powerful political men. So would you be happy if the next Secretary General is a woman who is essentially a product of these paternalistic networks? Would this be a game changer? Thank you. But uh, I'm not going to give it easy to the other camp either. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I wanted to ask, have you given up on gender parity altogether? Uh, or is gender parity necessary as part of a bigger strategy to, uh, to address profound inequality? So you do, you do you just throw it out of the window? Okay. Well, and then we have a question from a colleague from Afghanistan. Yes. Thank you very much. My name is Saraya Dalila. I'm ambassador from Afghanistan to Geneva. A big proportion of world's population live in fragile countries, whether they are in low income or middle income countries. And the challenges for girls and women are enormous, are too many in those countries, from physical security to access to social services, including healthcare and education, as well as justice and economic opportunities. And we know that causes to address gender parity or gender equality are also interrelated, inclusive, and mutually reinforcing each other. So my question is whether we, we are looking into those challenges from a game changer perspective or gamble or both or none, my point is, where is the starting point? Mm. Should we focus on quantity and quality, both at the same time? Should we fo start with quantity and at the same time address equality issues and quality issues? Or where it comes first? I think the discussion is very, the discussion is very thought provoking <coughs> and very interesting, but it's not about equal pay for the equal labor or for the equal work. It's about how you get her to the work how we make sure that she has the skills and she has that, that opportunity to be in the market. Thank you very much. Super, thank you so much. All right, we're gonna give the floor to the team for the motion. I'd like to abuse my uh, moderator role by throwing in a couple additional questions. One has to do with the assumption that women being uh, present, uh, that, they, that if they're simply in the room, that all of a sudden women's issues are taken care of. This is a, a critique very often on the parity debate, which I would very much like you to respond to. Um, but also to both sides, in terms of the measures that you are proposing, the, what the team four is proposing is essentially a more holistic approach to dealing with the root causes of the inequality in the first place, but also on the gender parity side. Well, 
how long do measures, corrective measures, need to be in place? How much is enough? The debate on this in terms of affirmative action in the US is a raging debate at the moment. How long do you put these measures in place uh, uh, in order to, and then know that it's either mission accomplished or you can, you can relax them? So maybe to the team for the motion, if you can start to respond to the questions. Thank you, Kate. <laughs> 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 I think in direct response to your question, um, well, we have to push human rights. Human rights has to be at the core of it all. The universality of human rights is actually central to pushing equality um, as a first step. In, in regards to, to Afghanistan, I think when it comes to, um, you know, when post-conflict work, I think, is, is, is beginning, representation of women is absolutely crucial. It has to be there. Um, and their role their, in meaningful dialogue is absolutely essential. Yet it's often the case that women are actively excluded um, from, from such talks. Um, and th so there needs to be very clear pathways for women to be able to participate. Um, and it's certainly crucial in these, settings, in these settings. And parity can actually help on that side of things. But clearly, it's only a, a parity is seen you know, as a small step. Um, and I think, you know, there has been a lot of post-conflict conferences on women's rights and the situation of women, etc. And in many instances, these have been organized, organized and attended solely by men. Um, and obviously, that is an absolutely huge problem. So we need to address what are the, the barriers to ensure women's participation in decision-making processes. And often in post-conflict work, we'll see that a lot of the meaningful decisions um, happen in very informal, very, very private, and very political spaces, and spaces that often that women do not occupy. And we have to address this. This is absolutely crucial. In regards to in regards to the awkward question at the back, and to another <laughs> question as well, um, I think you know um, if gender parity, and I think the other side have said as well, gender parity is the stepping stone, it is a tool, it is a strategy. Are you changing sides? No. <laughs> I want to lure them, I want to lure them over to this side. And I think they have admitted that it's only one small step. It's, a, it's part of a strategy to be able to reach equality, which is what the four team are espousing. We want to push for equality. But, um, so, the question... In all fairness, both sides are arguing for equality. It's a question of how you best, best get there. The parity isn't the game changer. Right, it's very, question. very <laughs> obvious, I think, from everybody's comments. It's not the game changer. Um, All right. So Let, let's, okay. let's give the other side a chance to respond, and then we'll come back to Kate. Yeah? Uh, yeah, on, on, on a, a couple of issues. Uh, sorry, yeah. Um, so how, how much is enough, how long, uh, affirmative action? You know, this is really uh, almost like, are, are you positivist? Are you uh, uh, somebody who's, who's positive about these things or who is who's negative and, and, and is, is uh, you know, is not optimistic? I am not optimistic. Uh, gender equality is something that uh, people have been fighting for, not just the last 10 years, but the, the fight has been around for it close to 200 years, and we're still at it. Mm -hmm. So uh, I believe actually that affirmative action is uh, gonna be with us for a very, 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 very long time, if not always. There's something so intrinsically, and this is where I agree with my uh, people on the other side. There's something so intrinsic Are you changing about, sides? I'm not changing sides, <laughs> uh, about, gender, uh, about gender, that it is very difficult actually to get beyond that. Uh, on the uh, question of uh, if women are present, you know, how do we get them? Do they actually automatically pick up the right issues? I think I've uh, answered to that a little bit already. I don't think the issues are really clear until women are there. The issues really need to be defined in that conversation. And, uh, and, and so the question then, you know, the, 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 we, we always have this. It, it means also recognizing that women have different interests. Right? They are not all the same. So they should have that privilege of also disagreeing with each other, which men have. So uh, that's why they have to be in those, um, in, in those uh, forums. And then, uh, Liliana, you always ask the hardest questions. Um, 
I think I, I would love for Angela Merkel to be the next Secretary General. And I, I'm saying that as a, uh, as a former German. Um, but, <laughs> but she... Uh, she comes out. Uh, she comes out of a, of a very, uh, you know, uh, patriarchal kind of network. And most women, most of us who are who have made uh, something out of ourselves, there have always been men behind that in some fashion, right? Because they are the ones who were in power. And so we need those male mentors to a certain extent. Now, are they going to make a difference? Not every single one of them, right? Uh, but uh, I think the point is they're there, and uh, it's a first step. Good. Very good. We're going to give the floor to Kate. Um, and to, we want one more round of questions. Uh, so all, prepare your last questions before we move to the closing arguments, okay? Well, thank you very much, and particularly to, uh, to you for crossing over to our side. <laughs> I didn't expect that we would persuade you so thoroughly, and uh, is the, is I really the public you have celebrate. To persuade? Yes. No, I, I'm ready to affirm you uh, a little later. Um, so I'm, I'm enormously grateful to hear that parity will always, this struggle for parity and affirmative action will always have to be with us because, in fact, it will never work. Um, and I, I think it's, it's not an argument that I'd occurred to me, but I appreciate it being made with such passion and elegance. And it reminds me that... You know, a dashboard is not a vacation destination. I don't know if you've ever realised that, but if you think about <laughs> driving off into the sunset to your vacation destination, yes, the dashboard's important. Some metrics matter, and watching the dial move up or down in terms of number of revolutions in the engine. I think I'm a former Australian, actually. <laughs> I, think. I just remembered the uh, ambassador of Australia's question. I think I'm a former Australian. Okay. But the dashboard's moving up and down. Um, but it's not a destination. It's not a vehicle. It's not the driver. It's not the route to the destination. And it's certainly not arriving at the vacation. And there's a real risk. I mean, I don't want to drive a car without a dashboard. Believe you me. And so, as a little dashboard, the number of women in positions of power that's really interesting. I want that data. I want to reveal it. And I want us to be accountable for it. But please don't confuse a, da a, a dashboard with a destination. They are two fundamentally different things. And we shouldn't be bought off so cheaply. Very good. Thank you. So too much focus on parity. We forget about the rest. I come from a place where you can walk on chew gum at the same time. So focus on parity, but also do all the other things we need to do uh, to make sure we get to destination, which is equality. Now, on the next Secretary General of the United Nations, how would it work if they were recruiting for the university? They would put an ad, and in the ad they would say, looking for an economist or a lawyer or a political scientist. Two, great experience. Three, management. Four, gender equality. See how we do it in the United Nations. It has to come from this region of the world. Okay. And then when someone says, well, what about gender? Oh, no, that's too patriarchal. It's just, per, you know, we're going to get this woman, if we get the woman, it's going to come through the same selection process that is kind of rigged uh, as, uh, as uh, the man uh, would. Do we have a problem if it's a man? No, we all of a sudden seem to have a problem if it's a woman. So what I say is, <laughs> let's go for a woman secretary general. Why not? Why not? And let's make sure, please, that is the best uh, woman we can choose. Someone that is expert matter, lots of experience, and management. Present because company excluded, right? No, I mean, we are not in the competition. But, you know, again, <laughs> so again, uh, if we don't have a problem uh, with uh, going for a man, let's not have a problem going for the woman. Actually, let's go for the woman. Okay. <laughs> well... We have a nice heated debate today. So, uh, a couple more questions from the lady there and from a colleague from UNCTAD as well. 
Thank you uh, for all the presentations. I'm a professor here in the history department, and I wanted to ask a question related to time and change over time. Uh, for Kate, uh, in particular, you, you used the example of Rwanda and how there's 60% women representation, and yet there's still issues of domestic violence. But that is so recent that there's 60% of women in the parliament. And I'm really wondering if you don't think that having more people who probably at some point have experienced or have known family members who've experienced domestic violence wouldn't change the nature of that debate over time. Or for issues like reproductive politics, having more women who, or more people who have may, may have been physically or could be physically affected by things like abortion policies wouldn't have some kind of impact, perhaps over a very long period of time as other things change along with it. And I just wanted to add um, one kind of possible parallel historical um, example of debates over suffrage in the late 19th and early 20th century, where a lot of these same things came up of, yes, but it won't change everything. We'll still just be voting for male politicians, or we'll still just be, you know, the, the society will still be patriarchal, even if we have the vote. And yet, I think, looking back, people would consider women's suffrage to be a game changer um, of pretty historic proportions. Thank you. Joachim. Thank you very much. Um, I'm at UNCTAD now, so I will ask you a question about the UN, but let me start by saying, as a former Swede, and talking about, <laughs> talking about time, I'm actually used to traveling uh, through time, and uh, I find myself finding being 20 years behind in this country, and as I travel around the world, I go even further back in time. So some measures to time warp us into the future would be nice. I, Kate, I completely disagree with you on the apples versus the barrels, and that leads to my question and to the other side. Uh, because you have to think that in a microenvironment like in a UN organization, it may be the current apples that is making the barrel rotten. So the question is, if you only have red apples, and the red apples are more acid and you just turn the barrel rotten, don't you need some green apples to balance it out? Now, Arantxa made a point, which she pleaded for more sophistication, so I will Although I agree with them, I will put them under the heat. One of the problems I face is I have, don't have a problem with making a, the argument that the organization that I'm deputizing would be much better with gender parity and therefore ensuring diversity. I do have a problem, however, making the argument that while we're been pursuing gender mainstreaming, that the gender parity inside the organization will have a direct effect on the effectiveness that we roll out gender mainstreaming and economic transformation. I think that's a leap to be taken. I would like to know your views on it. Okay, that's two questions in one. <laughs> and then I think you've had your hand up since the beginning. Over here. Oh, sorry. Hi, my name is Eleanor Kanja, and I am a PhD student working on gender issues. And my question is more so to this side of the debate right here. There was a question earlier to say that if parity is not the answer, then what are the solutions? And I feel like that question wasn't answered very clearly. And to kind of um, back that up, I also want to ask, uh, you know, if you say parity is not the answer, then how do we make sure that diversity is included? How do we make sure that there is an inclusion of, of people of color, there's an inclusion of the disability, there's you know, an inclusion of, of different types of people? Thank you. Very good. I'll also make a note that we are going to move to voting in just a minute. Uh, our colleagues are going to also prepare their two-minute summing up uh, after this, the, these answers. We're going to turn to them to do their two minutes each summing up of their argument in no less uh, vigorous form than they have to date. But uh, you will be asked to vote. What I want you to do is to take your little pieces of paper. Yes, thank you, sir. Um, if you are voting for the motion for this team, you're going to put the green paper in the box. Uh, if you're voting against, you will put the blue motion in the box, the blue uh, ticket in the box, and I expect not to see any white uh, ballots, please. All right, so let's answer the questions that we've heard. Kate, you were the first one. Sorry. Well, thank you very much uh, for the questions. Let me, let me take up this issue of the framework, the framework of change. It's quite clear that gender parity is an interesting but insufficient answer. Uh, education, 
legislation, regulation, participation, and critically, tailored essential services that dignify the lives and bodies of women are just as important and more pressing. And it seems to me that the example of trying to secure parity for girls in schools is very instructive here. Yes, we won under the MDGs parity for girls in primary school. But do you want to know where they are in secondary school levels? For participation, they are nowhere. The minute they hit puberty, all that parity faded away. Why? Unskilled teachers, unsupported sanitation and personal hygiene services, no access to comprehensive sexuality education, no access to protection from forced and early marriage, no access to contraception. How can we possibly be talking about gender parity as if it can exist on its own, as a little first, as a modest first step towards this great project? It must be integrated in a total framework of services. I don't want any apple in any barrel. I find the idea of confining apples fundamentally offensive. <laughs> if an apple wants to be in a barrel with free prior and informed consent, then allow the apple to be in a barrel. No, Otherwise, no, no. let the apples go. Thank you very much. We also had the question about the history lesson about uh, the gender equality issue. Will you want to come in on these questions? Okay, just prepare to your answer. Go ahead. Do you want to say something about the historical? No? Okay, well, let's turn the floor over here. Um, yeah, Nicole, I thank you. Uh, yes, time matters. Uh, it's not a particularly good answer, but I'm fully with you on this, and thank you for bringing this up. I wanted to say a few uh, uh, things about apples also. Uh, <laughs> it strikes me that um, I, I think you're exactly right. right? Having gender parity in uh, an organization does not automatically change the policies of those or that organization, and it doesn't provide automatically an imp impact, impact on the ground. Um, having said that, uh, not having gender parity certainly guarantees that there is not any change. And I think we also need to get away from that idea that organizations uh, somehow um, are organized in such a fashion that there is somebody at the top, uh, everything filters down, and then something gets translated. I like to think of organizations, and I'm saying that as somebody who studied gender mainstreaming quite extensively, I think we really think, need to think about organizations as places where all kinds of conversations happen and some things get translated and that don't get translated. So it matters who is there. Right? And it's the first step. It changes the game, right? It changes the game. Think about the military, right? How many military people have you heard talk about, well, once we had women in the military, it just changed the whole atmosphere and what we were talking about. So. Thank you. you want to answer the question as well? Yeah. Thank you. And fantastic question. I think, you know, what are the alternatives to parity? I mean... Right. And how do we include all of diversity? Well, we have to. I mean, parity, and we need parity of opportunity. And this is it. And it shouldn't be limited by gender construct. It's got to go much broader. It's got to address age, ability, race, um, everything. Um, so otherwise, we are disenfranchising so many groups of people that don't conform to the normal, privileged, heteronormative norms, and these will be the people that um, make the most through gender parity initiatives. So, you know, if the goal is equality, and that is what we want, if the goal is going to be equality, we cannot just say, okay, men, women, what about all of the other um, issues and all of the other aspects of diversity that need to be included if we are gonna have actual equality overall? So, so for me, that's what I would, I would say. Thank you very much. All right, we're going to start our summing up now. The speakers have two minutes each. We're going to go in reverse order, so starting with Arancha. 
Gender inequality is a massive loss to society and to economy. Few would argue that parity is a bad thing. What we argue is that parity is a necessary condition for achieving gender equality. It's an insufficient but necessary condition. Gender parity helps giving voice to the voiceless. We all have our baggage, our social baggage, which by confronting us with different people, with different ideas, with different practices, gender parity helps us unload. To sum up, five facts to support uh, voting against the motion. One, gender parity is uh, the rising tide that can lift all boats. Two, comprehensive measures to improve gender parity can defy gender-based stereotypes and expand our notion of leadership. Three, gender parity is a necessary, is a co component, but of a larger comprehensive strategy to promote gender equality, the empowerment of women, and all benefits which come uh, with uh, these gains. Four, gender parity is a performance driver and an imperative for any organization who wants to perform at the highest levels. Finally, but most importantly, gender parity is a simple principle to implement and measure. So please vote against the motion. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much. Kate, you have the floor. Uh, Two minutes. Well, th thank you very much for the support that I know you've given to our team. Uh, <laughs> because you're, you're clearly people of great wisdom. You've chosen to be here. Um, I think, however, in solidarity, we should really appreciate, uh, however misguided, uh, our opposition. I mean, let's be clear, they've confused the tactical with the strategic, with the principled. Gender parity is a tactic. The strategy must be comprised of something much more holistic if we're to uphold the fundamental principle of equality. We don't have time for this long-winded game plan that eventually some women in Parliament will deliver equality. And I tell you why we don't have time for that. Because as the motion says, this is about gambles. In other words, it's about theories of change and theories of achievement. And in this particular tactic, we're exporting risk. It's not us who is taking the risk. We're not suffering directly, materially and gravely from the absence of gender parity or gender equality. It's those who will never have access to the fruits of that elite project. Is really gender parity going to address the child rape? Is gender parity going to put a girl through school without being subjected to intimidation? Is gender parity going to deliver a girl child from forced or early marriage? I put it to you, it's an interesting part of an over pro overall project and in the long run, as has been admitted by so many, maybe it will pay off. But to export risk in that way to those with the least power and the least resources, that's unacceptable. Thank you very much. <laughs> Elizabeth, two minutes. Gender parity is just simply the right thing to do. If we want to have democratic societies, if we want to have inclusive societies, if we want to have justice, uh, gender parity is a non-brainer. Uh, it helps us to realize all people's intrinsic rights and allows them to develop their cap capabilities. And when all are included, then they can develop their own uh, capabilities and can vocalize their own interests. Uh, gender parity also is a smart thing to do because when all are included in polities, they can also work to prevent harmful practices, harmful outcomes, and enhance the welfare of all, such as combating violence, which is uh, costly to all societies, such as giving all people rights to own property, to inherit and contribute to wealth creation in that way, such as including people in uh, 
peace negotiations and create more stable societies that way. So gender parity is a crucial ingredient uh, if we want to go forward and make our societies more inclusive. Thank you. Stuart, you have the last word. Okay, thank you. Well, I guess, um, I guess my question to you then is, do we want parity or do we want equality? What is the most important? For me, putting all the eggs in one basket of pushing for parity is such a huge risk. It really is. We should be striving for full equality. And parity is a small tactic, as you said, on the way to achieving equality. More than that, it is not. That's, that's what I'm going to say. Oh, very quick. All right. Thank you very much. <clears throat> now, our, uh, our uh, little army of students is actually compiling the data as we speak on the voting. We're going to hear the results in just a minute. But in the meantime, if we can ask Ambassador Hamamoto to come and give a, a closing remark, and then I'll announce the results. The speakers can stay on the, on the podium. Wow, that's a tough act to follow. <laughs> Who needs coffee when we have these guys? <laughs> um, anyway, I'll be brief because I know you all are all anxiously awaiting the results of the vote. Um, but I wanted to start by just thanking the Graduate Institute for hosting this very lively event and um, especially um, offer a special thanks, um, uh, Philippe, to you, uh, director of the Graduate Institute for joining our network of Geneva gender champions. And I see a, a lot of other gender champions in the audience, so please join in the audience. So please join me in welcoming Philip to our network. The commitments made by the uh, 90 plus uh, gender champions, we're approaching 100, um, are already making a difference in our work and in our organizations. And we're gonna focus on continuing to broaden and deepen our commitments to further improve the lives of women and girls, uh, both here in Geneva and around the world. Um, I also wanted to thank the debaters and um, all of you for being here today and um, for your engagement. Yesterday, many of us kicked off International Women's Day with a UNOG event at the Palais that was uh, focused on better defining and tackling unconscious bias, um, which I noted is both pervasive and quite powerful. Um, this morning, Arancha and I hosted an interactive discussion on women and girls in STEM. Uh, we had a very diverse group from government, civil society, international organizations, and academia, including a very passionate and impressive young woman from the International School of Geneva. Um, she was 15 years old. And uh, if not for ourselves, let's really demand change uh, for her generation because um, she was just incredible. And um, those young women really, really deserve better. Um, so join me in, um, in that endeavor. Um, I also participated on a tripartite panel discussion at the ILO this morning uh, with government workers and employers all represented. Um, the discussion was focused on gender equality in the world of work and the role of the SDGs in driving progress. And tomorrow, um, I'm really looking forward to attending the Barbershop Conference hosted by the Ambassador of Iceland, an almost all-male panel. Thanks to Kate for saving the day. Uh, the panel's entitled, uh, Changing the Discourse Among Men on Gender Equality. And from what I've seen today, those men better get a good night's sleep. <laughs> <laughs> but these are just um, a few of the events um, uh, that are taking place this week in commemoration of International Women's Day here in Geneva. And I wanted to, to mention those events um, 
really just because they help paint a picture. They paint a picture of the diversity of issues that fall under the gender moniker, um, parity, harmful stereotypes and discrimination, the gender pay gap, um, harassment in the workplace, seemingly immovable barriers to entry, uh, the role of the, me of the media, including social media, and of course the role of men, um, because we all know that these aren't just women's issues. And I also uh, just wanted to mention these events to illustrate the fact that the Geneva community um, over the last few months has really come together and we're pushing each other to both raise awareness and to drive towards solutions. And I feel that um, we're really gaining momentum and um, we um, are no longer content to uh, accept business as usual. Um, in coming here today, I actually wasn't sure how I would vote. The question of parity is, is as you've heard, as you've seen here today, very complex and, and nuanced. Um, when we were uh, designing the Geneva Gender Champions Panel Parity Pledge, um, we purposely didn't demand that all panels must be 50-50. Instead, we put a tool in place that instills in GGC organizations a deliberate and thoughtful process to combat unconscious bias. So is that enough? Is demanding parity a risky gamble? Perhaps, but I believe that it's a risk worth taking and one that will continue to define our push for gender equality for many years to come. Uh, so thank you all for being here. I'm uh, guess turning this back over to Scott for our <laughs> much anticipated results. <laughs> Scott, are you ready? Goodness. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Hamamoto. I just wanted to, to uh, repeat also the recognition of your leadership here in Geneva on the Geneva Gender Champions Initiative of which I'm a proud signatory as well on behalf of Interpeace. So thank you again for your leadership on this. Before, before, before I read the results on who won, remember that this is not about who voted more for one side or the other. It's about the swinging. And primarily, as I said, there were 25% don't knows. And now there are, I think, 2%. So it was... And, and the purpose of a debate style like this, remember, is, is not, I mean, they're all, they're all looking for gender equality. The question is the path and the, and the tactics versus strategy and issues like that. But um, the purpose of a debate like this is to make us all smarter about the issues, it's to make us more critical in our thinking about the issues and not get stuck on any truths, uh, universal truths. So uh, if you can join me in thanking the four team for their great arguments. and the against team for their great arguments. <laughs> so, if I can recall the results before the debate, we had 13% for, 62% against, and 25% undecided. After the debate, we have 33% for the motion, 65% against, so they still got more votes, but the swing is very largely in favor of the four camp. So please join me in congratulating the four camp who are the winners of this debate. But we're all winners because we're all smarter about the issues. So thank you again to the organizers, the Graduate Institute, and, uh, and uh, the Geneva Gender Champions. And thank you for the opportunity of moderating this. Have a good afternoon.